The psalmist writes, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We're glad that you're worshiping with First Presbyterian Church of Ponca City, Oklahoma today. You're invited to find out more about our family of faith by finding us on Facebook. Wherever you are today, your space can be a meaningful place to worship. So please join us in our opening sentences. We worship the living God who knits us together when we were yet unnamed and welcomes us with appearance and grace. We worship the almighty God who searches us and knows our hearts and still loves us completely. We worship the eternal God who seeks us wherever we are and shepherds us with a guiding hand. And now trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins together. Let us pray. O Lord, you have searched us and known us. You know when we cultivate kindness and our lives bear fruit that blesses the world. You know too when our words sow seeds of discord and our actions choke out generosity and grace. When we produce more weed than wheat, forgive us. As we wait with eager longing for your reign to be revealed in our midst, Plant within us gifts of love and mercy, so that we might live as children of the kingdom and bear fruit that enriches your harvest. Amen. And now stand firm in your faith, covered by the saving grace of God, and ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our, our Lord. Amen. Today, I will be reading from chapter 8 of Romans, verses 12 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that we live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father, 
The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If we indeed share in his suffering in order that we may share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in order that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay, brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
We have been reading together in this season after Pentecost from Matthew's Gospel on a regular basis. Today we're going to take a look at the Old Testament passage for the lectionary today. We're reading from Genesis 28, beginning with verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. The word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Perhaps you've heard of the Iona community of Scotland. The Iona community made a form of contemplative worship very popular a few years back and produced some beautiful music as well. It also helped to popularize the idea of thin places. Thin places, according to Celtic tradition, are places where the holy and the ordinary seem to have a very thin boundary. Places where one might experience the presence of God in a special way, an intimate way. This idea that there are thin places is not a new idea. The concept originated in the pre-Christian pagan cultures of Ireland and Scotland. And as Christianity became the predominant religion of, Celt of Celtic cultures, the concept appeared in Christian forms. There have been places where I have found it a little easier to concentrate on God's presence. Places where I more easily focus on God. Black Mesa out in the Oklahoma Panhandle is one of those places for me. It's a rugged and isolated place and perhaps the quietest place I've ever been. But location is not the only factor. Perhaps thin places are also thin moments when we are more sensitive to God's presence. Perhaps sometimes our defenses become thin and we become more malleable and accepting of God's presence in our lives. Our Old Testament reading today gives us the story of a man who intensely experienced the presence of God at a moment in his life when he was running away from home and quite frightened, Jacob experienced God in the midst of a life-altering crisis. Jacob was not looking for a religious experience, and Jacob was not exactly a holy person. He was, in fact, a criminal who defrauded his own family out of a fortune and was caught red-handed by his brother Esau, who swore to kill him. Jacob was a liar, and he was a cheat. He purchased his brother's birthright with a pot of lentil stew and had tricked his aging, nearly blind father into the family blessing by disguising himself with the help of his mother to look and feel like his brother, who should have received the blessing, which also conveyed control of the family wealth. Jacob was not particularly a nice guy at that point in his life. Jacob came from a worldview that was built on the idea that God was high up on the top of a mountain somewhere, or perhaps even somewhere higher up in heaven. God was distant, and Jacob thought that he traveled alone. He held the view that he and God were in completely separate worlds. 
So now he was a man on the run who found shelter beside a rock, fell asleep, and had a dream. Dreams are an important theme in our Old Testament. They often bring messages from God. And this dream brought Jacob into the presence of the holy. Our Hebrew text says in this dream, Jacob saw a set of stone steps. Now you've probably always heard the word ladder, Jacob's ladder used here, because that's the word King James translators used way back in 1611. More than 400 years later, many translators still defer to that translation, but the Hebrew actually indicates stone steps. It's not a huge issue, except that stone steps form a stone-stepped building called a ziggurat, and those buildings were associated with holy places. It was the first symbol in the dream that indicated something different, something extraordinary was happening to Jacob. He saw messengers from God, and they were able to move between the holy and the ordinary with ease. There was movement between heaven and earth. They were not so very divided after all. Then Jacob saw the very presence of God in that thin place and received a message directly from the creator of the universe. And here's the amazing part of this for all for me. Jacob's God, the God of his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham was not concerned about what Jacob had done. There was no reprimand in this message. There was no threat of punishment. There was no shaming. Instead, what Jacob received from God in that lonely moment of crisis was a promise and a challenge. The very land where he slept would become a homeland for his descendants. His descendants would be an unnumbered multitude, and through them God would bless every nation. Jacob was on the receiving end of a covenantal statement. Jacob, a liar and a thief could have never stolen the treasure God gave to him that night, the gift of unfettered, lavish grace and love from God himself. He was given the gift of purpose and the challenge of becoming the things God knew he could become. Jacob may have escaped his brother and his father, but he could not escape the realm of God's love and compassion. God caught up with him. This dream is Jacob's first up close and personal encounter with the God of his fathers and with the holy. It's one of the many turning points in his life. God continues to show up at critical moments in Jacob's story. He awakes from this dream awestruck. And that is what God does for us. Often God comes to us when we least expect to encounter the holy. God comes to us even when we are less than we can be and comes to us without condemnation, but rather to reveal divine love to us and to help us to change. God's there to smooth out our rough edges and change our minds and hearts and bring renewed hope and promise to us. That's why God sends Jesus, the healer, the redeemer of our souls. Jacob wakes up and exclaims, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He built an altar there, and he called the place in Hebrew, Beit El, or Bethel, the house of God. Our job right now is to learn to see the holiness in all of our moments, in the place where we are right now, and to proclaim with our forebear in the faith, surely God is in this place. Surely God is in this moment. Our job is to open our eyes to the holy that surrounds us in the beauty of nature, in our darkest moments of sorrow, in our greatest challenges, and in our joys. Our job is to find holiness in one another. We need to recognize the holiness in each other now more than ever. Jacob's story assures us that God is not distant, but is transcendent and present with us through all of creation. As Christians, we believe that centuries after Jacob's encounter with the, with the Holy, a child was born and was named Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus experienced all of life just as we do. Through him, God knows us and we know God. 
and we are never alone in the loneliness of the night. So may you know the presence of the holy. May you find awe and wonder in your days. May you engage in the purpose God gives you, and may you deeply know God's love for you each and every day. Amen. Now may the grace of Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you and all those you love, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>